Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly podcast where I try my best to answer some of your questions, usually about knitting. Sometimes we get into other things like spinning or cooking or who knows what. Uh, but today is pretty knitting heavy and y'all asked some really fun, interesting questions this week. So I am excited to get into them. Thank you so much to everyone who left me a birthday message as well. I really appreciate it. It was a very special birthday. So thank you so much to adding for adding to it. I am wearing today my LYS, my little yellow sweater, and this is knit up in a fun collaboration yarn with La Bien Aimee and Retrosaria, the Mondim base, which is one of my favorites for socks, but it is a great one for sweaters, which actually I hope I remember to circle back to this on a later question. I'm just going to put it right here. Um, yes. Anyways. It's a great little yellow sweater. And I'm pretty sure this is yellow. Brick Road is the colorway, and it is just a really great yellow. So, all right, let us jump into some knitting questions. To short row or not to short row in Tennessee? I love that this one had like a little Dear Susie uh, kind of title. I, right now, feel like maybe it would have been a good idea for me to make coffee before I started this, but I'll just pull from my inner, my inner well of energy. Okay. Ba -ba. Hi, Andrea. I love your videos. I watch them while I knit and my boyfriend enjoys them too. Thank you. Uh, your patterns got me into sweater knitting. Yay. And now I can't seem to knit anything but sweaters. Girl, me too. I actually really, I think I've even said it on here before. I'm like, I have got to knit something besides a sweater. I have been so sweater heavy, but it is just the way I think now. Every time I look at yarn, I start thinking of the sweaters I want to make. But I, I have a hankering to knit a shawl, some socks, a hat. So I really need to um, get away from the sweaters for a minute. I mean, not get away from them, but like, let's... Uh, what's the words I want? You know, spread the love. Anyways, I've been knitting for 16 years, always blindly following a pattern. Last week, I tried to design a vest. I want to knit the back piece, then with a new needle, pick up stitches on the right and left front for straps. I noticed that sweaters and tops usually include short rows for the back, but since I am working the back separately from the front, do I really need them? Thank you for your help. No, you don't. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. So think of short rows as a way to fine tune your knitting. It just depends on how you want that fabric to fit your body. And the thing with knitted fabric is it's very flexible. It's not like a sewn garment that has super strong seams, especially if you're knitting seamless by picking up those stitches and going down the front. Um, and depending on the weight of the yarn you're using, how close fitting it is, are you having positive ease in there? All of these things can add to whether or not that extra bit of shaping is really going to take your finished piece over the top. So I love short rows. They are in most of my sweaters, but I think this one, I even went back and added them. Um, so Short rows are fabulous. The reason why I would recommend using them in a vest, which again, you don't have to, especially depending on like how big you're making your straps. And again, just how tailored you want it to be. But a nice, <clears throat> sorry, there was like, all of a sudden the air feels thick. Anyone else experienced that? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I should have brought my water up. Okay, so. Here's what I would have you think about. The reason you would want them on a vest is less about raising the back neck, because as you said, you're knitting the front and back separately. So you can use, you know, you're just gonna have a longer strap section, front shoulder section is maybe what I would call that, um, before you wanna connect the neck. You're gonna create more of a scoop to avoid the riding up. So a lot of times in a top down sweater, I mean, it can be bottom up, but a lot of times, in a sweater that's knit in the round, 
particularly, I'm just adding extra things that don't matter. <laughs> Rewind that. A lot of times what's happening is we are using short rows to add fabric back here so that our sweater's higher in the back neck helping it to then sit lower on the front neck so you don't get that kind of choking feeling. You know, a lot of people find it very uncomfortable if their sweater is too high on their neck. So that is one reason why you would want to use short rows. So no, I don't think you need to do that in your vest. But a reason you would want to use short rows in these shoulder straps is if you, do you see how the line of my shoulder is higher here and then it slopes down to the tip of my shoulder? This varies a lot by individual not some people have a very steep shoulder slope other people it's more <laughs> i'm trying to make mine look more gentle um some people have a gentler shoulder slope but basically if you did put a wedge of fabric using short rows into both the front and the back they would mirror each other so think of like a little a little triangle like this Ding, ding, ding. If I was real fancy, I would totally figure out a way to make a little line appear as I did that, like do, 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 and you would see it and it would be so clever, but I'm not that fancy. So use your imagination. But you would do a triangle building up your fabric with your short rows and you would do both, it's the same way front and back of that vest shoulder flap call it um and that would mimic the slope of your shoulder which would just give you a better fit how much would you notice if you didn't do that good chance probably not much again because knitted fabrics really flexible but in certain knits when you really want it tailored it can be what just puts it over the top to perfection. So it's totally up to you and it's really fun to play with. Um, so maybe try it out. The fun thing is, is if you're working for the top, from the top down, which you were, a fun experiment could be a, as thinking of it as kind of like a big old swatch where you would do the back, do those little short rows, and then only knit it down, you know, to maybe, you know, three inches, four inches, and then <clears throat> go ahead and start the front and do the same thing and try it on and then do one without the short rows and just see which one you prefer the fit of. Does one feel better as it's laying on your shoulders? Um, and just see, see what brings you the most joy. Okay, next question. I love the look of double knit button bands and will sub them into most Cardi patterns. They are very beautiful. Uh, my preferred method is picking up stitches around the edge of the cardigan and incorporating these stitches as I go double knit back and forth. So what I'm thinking you're saying, my preferred method is picking up stitches around the edge of the cardigan. So I'm thinking that you pick them all up and then it's almost like an applied border where you're then like knitting two together every time you work a row back and forth. I think that's what you're saying. Um, generally for stockinette, I just pick up one stitch for every stitch on around the edge and it turns out great. But I'm wondering how the number of stitches I need to pick up may vary for other stitch patterns. Do I need to pick up more or less for something like brioche or half fisherman's rib? So it really is going to depend on gauge and needle size. So if you are going to, it's funny in my head, I was like, oh yeah, I know how I would answer this. And now I'm, other ideas are popping up in my head where I'm like, hmm, honestly, I think it's going to take some trial and error and you're just going to have to try it out. My initial response was no, I would still probably do the same amount, but it's really just going to depend. So by nature, brioche and fisherman's rib are also a double fabric but the yarn overs that you use or knitting into the stitch below for fisherman's rib um by nature creates a more open and larger fabric so in general even if you are a really tight knitter you are going to loosen up when you knit brioche and it's because of the way that fabric's constructed i have read that with double knitting, I've actually pretty much only used double knitting for um, belts. I love to use them for the belt on a sweater. And it, this is so timely because I literally yesterday just had this little bubble of 
curiosity about double knitting and started watching like some YouTube videos and looking at my books. So it's fun to be thinking about this right now. But I did read that double knitting, you also tend to knit at a bit of a looser gauge. Um, so maybe it wouldn't be an issue and you could totally try and just do it one for one as well. Where it really stood out to me that I think it would change is in a fabric like garter stitch is so much more condensed because of those knit and pearls collapse on each other. But with blocking, that can also open up. So really what we're coming to is I do not have a great answer for this question. And this is one of those things. So this is a great look into my mind as a designer. I just have to try things. I cannot just know or read it or visualize it and be like, all right, that's that. Like, I would have to do it with my hands and just try it out. I think that's why I like designing because that is the curiosity that drives me of like, well, I just have to try this and see. I mean, I can watch videos all day long. You know, I can look at all my books and all those things. But until I've actually done it with my own hands, I'm like, Ugh. so anyways, anybody else has any thoughts on that? Uh, feel free to chime in. But I think for me, it would probably be a little bit of trial and error one good way to maybe try it out would be to do it on a swatch so that you aren't sitting there picking up all the stitches of your button band getting halfway through just to realize mm, this is going to be too long or too short for my cardigan so doing a decent sized swatch you could even make a bit of a longer swatch and then picking up on the sides of that and just seeing how you like how that looks might be a great idea. It could be if you're ever in a knitting rut and you just need to do like some small little projects done and dusted, you could even just have a little swatch party and try a few different things. You could do garter stitch, brioche, stockinette. You seems like you already know stockinette. You're pretty good on that one. Um, but mosaic knitting, that's really interesting how that affects your row gauge so much because of all of those slip stitches. It creates a really condensed gauge. Um, so yeah, it would be so interesting to just do a bunch of swatches and see how that works out and then put those notes into your knitting notebook. And then, you know, like, oh, I'm currently knitting a mosaic cardigan, but now I know because I've made all my little, I have my little swatch party. I know that what I'm really going to like for this is if I do this ratio to pick up that double knit button band. Um, if you do do that, please come back and share with all of us because I would love to know the results. Maybe I will do that as well. We can have a big old swatch party. <laughs> all right. By the way, I have noticed that I have gotten into this horrible habit of I missed a question like two weeks ago. I just skipped right over one. So I have to be more careful. Um, Y'all probably notice when I'm, you're like, you only did four questions. <laughs> okay. I'm new to knitting. I'm just now a paranoid. Okay, I have definitely done both of those. All right, I'm new to knitting. Began last August after crocheting for a while, and I can't stop. Um, thank you for the articulate instructions in your patterns. It justifies every one of my purchases. Well, thank you so much. That's really, really lovely as a designer to hear. Your biggest hope is that your instructions are clear and helpful for people knitting your patterns. Um, my question though is of all your handmade knitted items that you regularly wear or have worn in the past, which one has held up the longest with normal wear and wash? The reason for this question is that I am an extremely frugal person. Um, I don't pay more than $5 for a top or $15 for dresser bottoms. It's just not necessary to me. However, I am dying to make sweaters, shawls, and etc. with good quality yarns and use the same yarns that are in your patterns. I've actually yet to make one single item in the yarn called for due to my personal insistence on my budget. So with that being said, if I can determine that I can make a garment last many years, it will really help me treat myself to a delightful, luscious, squishy, comfy yarn. Thank you for your precious time. So one thing I did just want to mention before jumping into my long lasting knits is with your frugal mentality, I wonder if you have ever tried upcycling sweaters because you can get some lovely yarn from sweaters that were already knit and you unravel them. A lot of people will go to 
um, some like resale shops and things like that and unravel the sweater. I know that there's tips and tricks. I would definitely search it because you have to be careful with how the sweater was constructed to make sure it will unravel in a long strand instead of um, little short bits of yarn, depending on how it was constructed. Um, but just something to throw out there. There was an account years ago Oh, I can't, I'm not going to be able to remember their Instagram name. It drives me nuts. I mean, I think we all have our feelings about algorithms and whatnot. Uh, but it's so hard now, especially when you follow a good chunk of people, that somebody, they you don't get to see everyone pop up in your feed anymore. Like every once in a while, I'll be like, I have not seen this person in forever pop up in my Instagram feed. And if you can't remember their Instagram handle, it's really hard to refine somebody. But anyways, I digress. There is someone um, who their whole account, they used to do that. I think they even used to sell the yarn, but they would upcycle yarn and they would dye it. I think they used natural dyes, but you could play around with dyeing it. Um, and using it again and just really neat. So anyways, just something to consider is that you don't have to break the bank um, to still knit up really lovely things. Um, so, but as far as what has held up, I will say this little yellow sweater knit up in the Mondeem. I, it's been one of my thoughts so often when I've worn it. I've never even shaved it. Like, I've never even had to deal with pilling on it. Um, so, again, this one was special collaboration between La Bien Aime and Retrosaria. And um, it's the Mondeem base. And it's just held up so lovely. It is a little scratchier. I don't even want to say scratchy. It's woolly. It's got some toothiness to it. I don't have any trouble wearing it. You know, I'm wearing it with a tank top. I have no trouble wearing that next to my skin. Um, but I do also know that everyone has different sensitivities when it comes to wool. Um, but to be honest, I was thinking about it and out of everything I have made since I started designing, let's say, because those are definitely the items I wear the most, the only things that haven't held up that I've gotten holes in are my socks. I have yet to have a sweater that has a hole in it. Um, now my husband on the other hand did wear through a sweater to the point where it was like shredded. Uh, but that was a gauge issue. So here's a couple of things to think about. Worsted spun yarns that are smoother are going to wear longer generally than a woolen spun yarn. That being said, I have a quite a few woolen spun sweaters. They're very, very warm. And again, none of mine have any holes or have fallen apart. Um, but a worsted spun yarn generally has a little more strength in it because of the way it's spun. More plies equals more strength. So you probably wanna use a plied yarn, not a single ply yarn, especially when it comes to garments because that's gonna hold up better over the long run. It's gonna pill less. And anything else how you wash it i mean remember you don't need to wash your sweater every single time you wear it i do a sniff test um <laughs> can't believe i just said that but it's it's true um unless there unless it smells funny or has a stain on it i'm not going to wash my sweater um except for if it's like end of season and i know i'm not going to be wearing it for a while and i had worn it quite a bit I do want to store them clean because that is one thing that can bring the, mo the moths to your sweaters is any sweat, skin cells, things like that left behind in your knits. That's actually what they're going to be drawn to, especially. Um, so you do want to store them clean. But they don't get the same wear and tear as I think some of my other garments because of the fact that I don't overwash them. But yeah, I, I think that hand knit sweaters are a really worthy investment because none of mine have broken down. Um, don't you do gauge, I think, is a factor. And that's been an interesting arc for me to learn over the years. There are some designers out there who like their favorite thing is to actually do things that are really loose gauge. So they'll look at sometimes um 
I don't see them as much on maybe indie dyed yarn, but especially on some of the classic yarns, you'll see a needle range that they recommend. And some designers will go up like two to three sizes from there because they really want drape in their fabric. But one thing to consider is the looser, it's knit. Just like adding plies to a yarn, knitting that yarn at certain gauges are gonna help strengthen it. So knitting it at a tighter gauge is gonna help strengthen it over knitting it at a looser gauge, um, especially important for socks. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope that helps. And again, there are definitely budget-friendly yarns out there, but it is, it's kind of one of those mis, misconceived, is that what I wanna say? I don't know. Um, it's one of those things that I think a lot of us think going into knitting that turns out to be not true is that it would be cheaper to knit a sweater than to buy a sweater. And in today's world of fast fashion and things like that, that's actually just not true when you consider the cost of yarn and needles, a pattern if you purchase one and the hours of your time you're gonna put in, it's generally a lot more expensive to make it yourself. But you also then get to control what you're putting into that sweater, what, where that yarn was made, how it was made, if it's wool, how those sheep were raised, fiber content, all the kind. There, there's so many little decisions that then you get to have control of compared to if you bought it from somewhere. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, I could really go off the deep end with this question. Um, but just thinking too about how those decisions impact the world around us workers and the planet and everything. I mean, you could just keep going with it, right? So it is all about kind of finding out what's important to you and those decisions you make. But I do think that there are choices all along the way um, to fit into different budgets, no matter where your heart lies within some of those. So, woo! Anyways, this is all the really great, um, but again, all of the sweaters I've made, and you can look at all the different yarns I've used, I really haven't had a whole pop up in one yet. So they're all going pretty strong. Um, so yeah. Okay, I, I'll link to this yarn so that y'all can find it if you're curious about it. And again, there is, um, there's the La Bien Aimee collab, but you can also just get Mondim from Retrosaria. It's in quite a few yarn shops and it is um, not a bad price point for what it is. Okay, hello, I have a sweater that I knit a year ago. At that point, I just wanted to knit and didn't know much about modifying patterns to fit my body. This sweater is super cute, basic, top down with a color work yoke. The problem is that it is really big in the torso. The arms fit great, the color work is dream state, the rest of the sweater is non super wash DK weight yarn. Woo, I said that funny. DK weight yarn. I am wondering if I can steak this, but cut out a column of the sweater that is a whole repeat of the yoke so that the edges of the front of the cardigan match. The repeats are only about 10 stitches wide. Are there things I should think about when considering this option? Is this too crazy? At this point, I might consider sacrificing the sweater to see this crazy idea through to the end, but it is a lot of really gorgeous yarn. Um, I just love your tenacity. And so I just wanted to be like, I am cheering you on. You should totally do this. Uh, I have a good friend who loves to cardiganize random sweaters from her collection. So 100% you can do that. Um, what I would do is I would find the middle of the repeat. So something to think about. You want to remove a whole repeat because you're thinking that will give you, you know, an even look on either side. Do you have a whole repeat that is smack dab center in the middle of the front of that sweater? Because that might not be it they might be off a little bit so that's something to consider another thing to consider is you're going to pick up in a button band so if they are not perfectly mirrored i don't think you're going to notice that much i mean i suppose if you wear it buttoned all the way to the neck all the time i mean it would look lovely to mirror them but i guess what i'm saying is i wouldn't get hung up on it because you're going to have a button band that separates them and especially if you end up wearing it open it won't be super duper noticeable. 
um, even if it's just like a row or two off, you know what I'm saying? But here's what I'm curious about because the, it sounds like the whole circumference is a little too big. I'm curious about your yoke and if that fits well, because you aren't going to be able to just remove circumference from the lower part of the sweater. It would be for everything. Um, but since you would add a button band, the thing I'm thinking is, do you almost need to do two steak lines so you can cut out a chunk from the middle so that you can make it smaller? Like, is that what you're thinking? The other thing you have to think about then too, is that is going to move your arms to the front a little bit, you know, cause, cause you've taken some of that fabric out. So that moves the armholes forward cause you're not taking any out of the back. So these are just things to think about. But if you're like, no, nah, I don't really need to reduce the width. I'm fine with that, but I'd be happier with it as a cardigan than a pullover. Um, you can also make, if you stick the front, you know, you can make that button band a little more narrow than the section that you're folding back. Um, but I say do it and I, I don't think you'll ruin it. I think that hopefully you'll just make it into something you want to wear even more. Um, so I'm very excited for you. I definitely recommend doing a reinforcement, a crochet one's a great one to do. Sewing machine's also really nice just because I think it can help boost people's confidence because they're so strong. But a crochet one is totally great if you don't have a sewing machine, even if you do have a sewing machine. Um, but let us know how it goes. Good luck. And yeah, that's the only thing I would think about is if you really are trying to remove width, just think about how that's gonna move those sleeve holes. All right, last question. I'm planning my first mom getaway since having kids. I'm taking my mom to New York Sheep and Wool. I love that your first mom getaway is with your mom. Super sweet. What's the most important tips for us to have a smooth weekend? I have no idea what to expect as a first timer. So I was actually just talking about this with my some of my local knitting spinning friends and didn't even realize I had tips and advice and still, until I started giving them to them. <laughs> um, so I've gone a few times and there are a few things just to think about. So... Um, getting okay first tip i would probably make if you're if you're not going to eat wherever you're staying i would make a restaurant reservation for a meal that day unless you're going to eat at the festival there are tons of food vendors and things like that but that's one thing i've always appreciated is it can be a mad rush at the end of the festival a lot of people leave towards the end and A, you get stuck in the parking lot trying to leave forever. So either try and leave early or try and leave late because there is that you're just kind of sitting in traffic for a long time trying to get off of the fairgrounds. Um, but everyone also floods into the town, which is Rhinebeck, and it can be hard to find anywhere to eat at that point. So dinner reservations are nice or have a plan to get back to your place to cook or eat at the festival. Um, I have never gotten to enjoy them because I have celiac, but I hear that the apple cider donuts are an absolute must. So I would consider doing that. Also, I've heard lots of good things about the maple cotton candy. If you've got a sweet tooth, um, Saturday is the busiest day in my experience. Saturday can be like, whoa, it is tons of people and it is definitely the kind of biggest day I would say of the event Sundays tend to be a lot slower and calmer so I think Sundays are actually a really lovely day to go that being said if there's something you really have your eyes on that you want to snag that you're specifically going to the festival for you might want to try and get there early Saturday to snag it before they're sold out like Jenny the Potter is a big one that everyone goes for um and I think things sell out really fast so that would be the drive to go Saturday is making sure you can snag what you would like but Sunday is definitely more calm a little more peaceful bring layers it the weather as I've talked about out of here is all over the show sometimes it's hot sometimes it's snowing in my experience, it's usually more on the warm side than the cold side um but there can be rain so just bring Look at the weather beforehand, but be prepared. It's nice to have a raincoat or an umbrella 
um, and definitely some layers. Everyone wears their sweaters, but sometimes you need to be able to tie that around your waist because it can get a little warm. Um, what else? There's lots of side festivals that people like to go to. Um, Wool and Folk is a really fun one. I've gone to that the past two years. Um, but there's other ones as well. They're, they're usually announced like all over Instagram and stuff like that. I can't even keep track of them all. So yeah, there's just a lot to do. But okay, here's probably my top tip. First year I went, I brought my five month old baby. So I was not going solo. And what was so lovely is even though there are a lot of people there, you can always find, as long as it's weather permitting, a nice little grassy patch to just go sit on and knit and just take like some downtime if you need to decompress from the crowds or anything like that. Um, but it's really so much fun. It is unlike anything else to be able to see everyone and they're showing off their knits to go check out all the animals there's tons of sheep they have sheep dog shows and um you can take classes there i mean it's just there's just so much cool stuff i mean it's really a fiber lover's dream there it's a great place to shop for buttons i didn't know that my first year i found that out later on and i was like oh my gosh it can be really fun to get buttons so that's usually something that my friends always want to go check out is the button booths you can find antique buttons and um that's really fun so I think also just being open to the unexpected that maybe you didn't think you'd find there I have gotten some fabulous like wool brim um hats there it's one of my favorite things I will say another favorite thing of mine that I've started getting at festivals um because sometimes you don't need any more yarn or fiber. I know some of you may be gasping at that, but um, I've actually loved getting socks at them because I love to knit my own socks, but sometimes you don't have the time. And I have found that you can get some fabulous socks at those festivals too. So anyways, it is really lovely. And I hope that you have such a great time if you happen to be knitting the tessellated fest or pullover please come to the meetup on saturday we will be there and speaking of that and if anyone else has any rhinebeck tips new york sheep and wool tips throw them in there um because i'm i'm sure there's more that i'm just not thinking of but this is i don't know why i'm grabbing this is my notions pouch i don't know why i don't know why i'm picking it up <laughs> i don't need it right now um oh don't lose your train of thought andrea so Tomorrow is another Instagram Live for our tessellated Rhinebeck Knit Along. We are going to be going live at noon Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Um, we actually, all four of the collaborators for this year's sweater and vest are in different time zones. So we, we literally have somebody at 9, 10, 11, 12. So we are trying to get times where all of us can pop into the live, but we are, that's what we're planning for. So again, it's going to be 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, which is 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Um, and that's 10 and 11 central and mountain time i don't know which is which off the top of my head right now but um but yeah we just jump onto instagram live we try to answer some questions and chat and we hope to see you there so that is tomorrow saturday the 12th and i think that's it i told you what i'm wearing i'll link to it below i'll also include links for the knit alongs we have got the attune shawl knit along the spin along going as well I have links for that. I am just about ready to announce the next spin it to knit it knit along. So that is coming. Um, I have had so much fun seeing everyone's hand spun after Tour de Fleece. It is all I want to be doing right now, spinning all the things. Um, even though I did not finish my TDF yarn, it is all in little balls waiting to be plied. Um, but when I get there, I will be sure to show you. I don't really have any other show and tell today. I will say, let's end it here. Um, you know, usually about once a year, once every two years, I start a design that by the time I finish it, I just realize, nope, this one's not gonna see the light of day. It just, for one reason or another, 
isn't going to leave the cutting room floor. And so that is one that I just bound off. And after blocking it, it just gave me trouble from the get-go. I recast it on about four times. I redid the sleeves three times. And it you would laugh if you saw it because it is so basic. It's a real simple looking sweater. <laughs> um but it's just not right. It's just not the right combination. And I know that I'll get there. I'm not letting the idea go, but it's not how I want it to be. And so that just happens sometimes. And I just have to start again. So <laughs> that's where I am today. I do, I actually have a lot of ideas that I'm excited to get going. So I'm just gonna dust myself off. <laughs> move on to the next one. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go play with some double knitting and let my curiosity and creativity lead the way and trust in it because it hasn't steered me wrong yet, right? Knock on all the wood. All right. I hope that y'all have such a good weekend. I hope to see you back here next week and happy making. Bye.